I'm starting it early. Have fun editing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to part two of the first article of the formula of Concord, the epitome. Again, a reminder, the epitome is the summary, it's the short version, right? So this is the short version, not the long version. And what you have in front of you as a handout is half of the short version. Uh, so today we're going to look at, uh, we're still considering the first article of the formula of Concord, that is concerning original sin, and we're looking at this week the negative statements. Uh, remember the structure of the formula of Concord is to define what the controversy is, to confess the truth, and then to reject Condemn the false teaching. Okay? Last week we looked at what is the issue and what do we actually confess. This week we look at what do we reject. Right? So this week we're looking at original sin and the teachings we reject regarding original sin. So that's the handouts you have in front of you. If you missed handouts of weeks before, uh, I have extras, right? So you're welcome to come stop at the stand and pick up some extras of the weeks that went before. And I'll just set them out here. Uh, the introduction to the formula, the epitome, and the formula of Concord, uh, Article 1, affirmative statements. They're, they're right here if you want to grab one after study. Is that fair? I'm even three-hole punching them, so if you decide to put them in a binder for future reference, you're welcome to. Not that you have to. Let's pray as we dig in. Gracious God, in your word, you teach clearly. You show us that sin is a very deep and thorough corruption of the nature you have created. A horrible and terrible corruption. Help us by your word, through your spirit, and in your son, to see how he has delivered and saved us from it. That we, by your grace, have hope in Christ, who, even as he raised Lazarus from the dead, will one day bring us to life again. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so somebody asked me, what, Pastor, why would we study all of this uh, highfalutin theology? Isn't it just semantics? <laughs> to which I immediately thought of a nice little pun. No, they're just not some antics. I know, slow clap, right? Good for you. You're yeah, yeah. Uh, no, they're not. It's not semantics. It's actually foundational, right? Uh, and we'll, we're going to see as we look at the negative assertions, uh, the things we reject and condemn, that even today in the church in the world, uh, this error is alive and well, right? It is alive and well. Uh, and, and we reject it and say, and condemn it, and say, no, we, as a church, we cannot abide by this. Uh, so we'll get to that as we go. Uh, so on our study sheet here, uh, original sin, note, the note at the top of the page for you today is not, let me make clear, is not part of the formula of Concord. It is a editory note. It is a summary. Okay, so I'll read this one. Uh, is sin part of mankind's very existence? No. 
For if it were, God would be accused of creating sin. However, sin is a very deep and thorough corruption of our human nature, a horrible and terrible corruption. No one except Christ Jesus our Lord can overcome this corruption for us and save us from it. Because of this sin, spiritually, we are utterly and completely dead. And this is what Ephesians tells us. We are dead in our sins and transgressions. <coughs> there is hope. As Christ raised Lazarus from the dead, so today he brings us to life again through his gospel in word and sacrament. The biblical position on this issue is explained in Articles 1 and 2 of the Formula of Concord. Article 1 is about original sin. Article 2 is about free will. I encourage you all to come back for Article 2. Right? So there's, there's less scripture in the what we reject than there is in the what we confess section of the formula of Concord. Why would that be? Because it's not what we reject is what is not in scripture. Right? So as we read this article, there's less scripture in what we reject and that there is in what we confess. What we confess is what the scriptures say. So there's a lot of scripture there, right? Like last week, we had a lot of scripture woven into what we read. This week, there isn't so much because what we reject is not what the scripture teaches. That's why we start with what we actually confess. You good? Okay, uh, let, we got a lot of reading to do. There's more people over there so there's one mic over there. Let's pass it around tables and start reading with paragraph 11. What we reject of the false and the opposite teachings. Let's read together. There, there's a mic right there on the middle table. So somebody needs to turn it on. And, and since you haven't turned it on, would you read for us? There you go. Paragraphs 11 and 12. We reject and condemn the teaching that original sin is only a debt based on what has been committed by another person, diverted to us, without any corruption of our nature. We reject and condemn the teachings that evil lusts are not sin, but a creation essential properties of human nature. This is taught as though the above dimension defect and damage were not truly sin because of each of which a person would be a child of wrath without Christ, not engrafted into Christ. What do these two paragraphs mean? What do they say? Original sin, yes, Caleb? This is not a question of fault, but a question of nature what our will is. Okay, it's not a question of fault, right? We're, we're not just looking at our forerunner, Adam, and blaming Adam as if to say, Adam caused this, but it's not really our condition. Right, it's not our, it's not our condition. Are we good there? We reject that the condition of original sin is not truly sin. That is to say, you have a sinful nature because you have inherited original sin. It has corrupted the creation which God made. You cannot escape it. But it is not your very nature. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns, rebuttals? We reject that. We, we reject them saying that it's just something you've inherited, but it's not really 
your fault. Like you aren't responsible for your original sin. And so the sins you commit because of it aren't really your fault. Are we good there? I mean, that one's pretty basic, right? Okay, so let's read 13, let's read paragraph 13, uh, 14, and 15. Let's read all three of those together. <laughs> Who's our next reader? Yes. Hand, hand Pam the mic so we can all hear her, please. Thank you. <laughs> um, back on 11 and 12, mm -hmm. Adam also said, I mean, he put off his own um, responsibility for sin and said, it's that woman who gave me. So who did Adam, let's, let's get into this, right? <laughs> if you got your Bibles, let's go there. Uh, let's go there. Let's go to Genesis. Because this is often more intriguing than we think it is. Uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And, and we'll read verse 12. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. Pam, since you asked the question, will you read that for us? <laughs> Chris is like, yeah, that's right. Okay. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Who does Adam really blame? <laughs> Let's be real careful, right? Who does Adam really blame? That God gave him a woman. Yeah, well, yeah, right. Adam blames God. A defective woman. Um, she said it, I didn't. Right? She said it, I didn't. Uh, right. Adam blames God. What we reject in our in paragraphs ten and or eleven and twelve, what we're rejecting is that God created this sin. <coughs> We reject the very thing Adam blames God for. This woman you gave me. No. God didn't make a defective woman. God doesn't make junk. God looked at all of his creation and said it is not just good. Very good. Right? For God who is holy to say something is very good. It was exactly the way he intended it to be. So Adam doesn't have a leg to stand on when he blames God for, as Pam said, quote, giving him a defective woman. Yeah, I'm going to blame you on that one. And then she turns around and blames somebody else. Folks, the blame game has been going on since day 12. <laughs> It's not a new thing. All right, are, are we okay then? We, we, what we're rejecting is that God <coughs> is responsible for this sinful nature. We're trying to find fault with somebody else. It's our fault. All right, paragraph 13, 14, 15. Yes? This paragraph 12 also rejects that evil lusts are not sin. Right. But they're created. So this is, folks, let's apply this one very directly to modern day society, to modern society. Right? Uh, this is, this is going to make some people uncomfortable. Who you lust after cannot be sinful. God made me this way. Excuse me? Sorry. The very center of who you are should not be defined by who you want to go to bed with. And if, and if that's the very center of your identity, we have another issue. 
right? But the teeth of it is that evil lusts are sin. They are not your created nature. You were not made that way by God. It is a corruption of the nature for man to lust after man and for woman to lust after woman. <coughs> Romans 1 is very clear about this. Right? So when people make the argument in culture today, uh, well, I was born this way. When it comes to their sexual desire. Uh, no, you weren't. Your corruption may make you that way. But God doesn't make junk. And this second paragraph, paragraph 12, <coughs> rejects that on the surface, like at the very foundation of the idea. Does that make sense? Thank you, Ryan, for including that in our conversation. They are not essential properties of the human nature. Now, can we get to 13, 14, and 15? Any other, any other things you want to bring up in 12, 11 and 12? There's a bunch. Right? I'm really trying to make sure we get through the whole article because I want to get to free will next week. <laughs> All right, let's hear 13, 14, and 15. Not next week. Oh, yeah, not next week. In two weeks. Hey, can we come here on Sunday morning for Bible practice? Three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. Oh, right. Pastor Vetter is not doing free will. So in three weeks, we'll come back, and, and hopefully I still have the helm of this Bible study and can get to it uh, free will. We'll find out. In the meantime, let's get to article, or let's get to paragraph 13, 14, and 15. Somebody, anybody who's got a mic over there? You, there's more people over there, so let's turn on the mic and hand it to somebody to read those three few paragraphs. You didn't know by sitting in the more populated space that you were going to become readers, did you? <laughs> Thank right. you. We likewise reject the Pelagian error. It is alleged that human nature, even after the fall, is not corrupt. And especially in sinful things, human nature has remained entirely good and pure in its natural powers. We reject the teaching that original sin is only a slight, insignificant spot on the outside, smeared on our human nature or a blemish that has been blown up on, upon it, beneath which nature has kept its good powers even in spiritual things. We reject the teaching that original sin is only an outward obstacle to the good spiritual powers and not a spoiling or lack of the powers. It is not like when a magnet is smeared with garlic juice and its natural power is not removed but only blocked, or when a stain can be easily wiped away like a spot from the face or paint from a wall. Okay. So Pelagius, or Pelagian, uh, was a <coughs> theologian who lived in about the 4th century and in the 400s, that's the 5th century. Um, he widely taught uh, that our nature was good, that people were basically good, uh, although his teaching on it doesn't become full-blown heresy until a little later. Uh, but he, he and Augustine, if that's a church father that is familiar to you, that name, he and Augustine were kind of backyard neighbors as far as where they were located in the world. Uh, and it's Augustine who takes up the Pelagian teaching as heresy. Right? Coming up? Luther was an Augustinian monk, right? So uh, Augustine comes against the teaching of Pelagius. Uh, Pelagianism, or uh, the followers of Pelagius, if you look at question one on the back side of the sheet, uh, Pelagianism is a heresy which takes direct opposition to the Bible's clear teaching of original sin. The followers of either Pelagius a British monk, or a so-called Pelagian heresy, argued that people are able to choose virtue without divine aid. People are able to choose virtue 
without divine aid. Here's my question. How do we see that manifest in the modern church? Any kind of works righteousness which is taught is Pelagian or semi-Pelagian. Right? Uh, you ever heard of a guy named Charles Granderson Finney? Most of you look at me with blank stares. That's fair. Right? Uh, Charles Granderson Finney, that's a name to remember, is the father of the American revivalism. You know, the Big Ten revivals? Uh, Finney believed Pelagius's error. Finney believed that if we could use the right techniques, the right psychological manipulation, the, although he would never have called it that, if you could use the right measures, you could bring people to the point of giving their lives to Christ and making a virtuous decision to follow Jesus. And so Finney constructed, quote unquote, the new measures. The new measures were what were employed by skilled orators and skilled presenters across the big tent American revival scene on whatever frontier they found it on, whether it be New York or the South or out West. And this big tent revival, the form of that service went something like this. According to Finney's design, we start with music. Music that gets you all fired up Music that then brings you into an almost trance-like state where you are very susceptible to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Suggestion. At which point, when you are in this emotional fervor or this emotional openness, the preacher would get up and hold forth preaching that was specific to you as an individual and what you could do to be a better Christian, disciple, mother, husband, spouse, child, whatever. What you could do, and then they would ramp up the music again so that you with these suggestions that you've been given, would, would, would willingly come forward to, to rededicate yourself to the Lord, to, to, to make a decision to be better, to be more holy, to be less sinful, to turn away from... Wait. You ever seen worship that looks like that? If you've ever been to a non-denominational worship service... That's the pattern. Right? Uh, if you're a YouTuber, uh, go to YouTube and search for contemporavent. Not contemporary and not relevant, but a smash up of those two words. Contemporavent. You will find exactly what I just described. Do you remember that video? The trendy glasses and the arm tattoo to let you know I've had a life before. Oh, yeah. Trendy t shirt and skinny jeans. Right? Yeah. Right. The error of Pelagius that you have some good or a majority of good that has been hampered by sin, but really you can make a good confession, you can make a good virtuous decision, is heresy. We reject it. Ephesians 2 lays this out clearly. 
We are by nature. Oh, that's the good Lutheran confession, right? From our liturgy. I'm glad you know it. That we are by nature dead in our sins and transgressions. <coughs> Let me ask, what can dead things do? Nothing. Nothing. But, but, okay. So the answer was, dead things can rot. Let me ask, do dead things make themselves rot? Or is that something that happens to them from outside of themselves? Dead things are powerless to do anything. Last week when we talked about the affirmative statements concerning original sin, I asked the question about what happens to the gospel if original sin is not confessed rightly. And the answer was, we lose it. Christ's, in, Christ's incarnation becomes something meaningless. His sinless life on your behalf becomes an example for you to follow. So, when we hear Christ taught as your example, not as your Savior, we hear the Pelagian error. You think this Pelagian error is not alive and well in the church today? Can you think of other examples where this Pelagian error is found in the life of the church in America? What would Jesus do? He would die on the cross for the sins of the world. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> what? I mean, we made a whole campaign about it, right? Well, wait a minute. When the church becomes a marketing tool that simply uses campaigns to influence people to do what is good and what is right, that's semi-Pelagian. Yep. It seems a slippery slope to if, if all people are inherently good, then there's a microphone somewhere you should be talking to. Multiple paths to heaven. Okay. Of course. Let, let's course. let's hand that off and hear that so we can so the camera can hear it too. Do do that again, please, Carrie. No, I just said it. It seems like a slippery slope that if all people are inherently good, yeah, that all paths can lead to heaven. So there's a universalism that is a slippery slope there. There's another word that I want to introduce to you, which is synergism. What is synergism? What does that word mean? Synergy. What's synergy? Working together. Yeah? So synergism is the idea that God has in Christ done some work and now you work with Christ for your salvation. As if Jesus comes 99 steps down Jacob's ladder and all you have to do is take one step toward him. Do we hear that kind of teaching in the church in the world today? Only all over the place. It's Pelagius. We reject it. Original sin has so corrupted our created nature that we are incapable without divine aid of anything good. Yes, Caleb? So the statement, I can be better or I can be good, is that a Pelagianism or I, and it's, you know, it's... The statement, I can be better or I can be good, is that Pelagianism. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, I'm convinced that Adam and Eve fell into <laughs> sin in the first place because they wanted to be better. What did God say when he looked at all that he had created? It was, very it was very good. And Adam and Eve wanted to be better <coughs> than what was, by the holy God, declared as very good. So 
when it comes to us being better, that is a very dangerous place to go. I would rather have us say, as Isaiah does, woe is me. But Christ. Right? So it's not about us. It's not about you. It's about Jesus for you. We confess, I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to Him. Right? Right? Enlighten me with His gifts. Sanctify and keep me in the one true faith. Right? Just as He does the whole Christian church on earth. It's all God's work. It's not mine in any portion. Yes, Carol? One of the things that makes me so give, give her the mic. One of the things that makes Finney so dangerous is that many people that look at him as a good guy. He was an abolitionist. He was the president of Oberlin College. He was a very much, a lot of people said, this is a really good guy. Yeah. And the danger is, is that they could follow him in good conscience and thinking they were doing something good. So the, the yes... The real rub of Finney's uh, Finney's theology is this. It doesn't matter the doctrine you teach as long as it brings people to the altar. And once you're at the altar, you're all... Right? It doesn't... It doesn't matter... Let me say this clearly so that you understand the implication. For the preachers in Finney's line, it doesn't matter the doctrine you preach. What matters is you get people to make a decision for Jesus. What matters is you're drawing numbers in who are giving their lives to Christ. Well, the good works will follow if you're doing it right. Although they have to continue to come back and rededicate themselves to the Lord. All of a sudden, I'm in the middle of a Ray Stevens song about the day the squirrel went to surf in the first self-righteous church in the sleepy little town of Pascadua. <laughs> That's the title. And the first line. And the first line of the chorus. Right? Uh, don't get me started on Ray Stevens. It's a rabbit hole. You don't want me to go down. It's hard to come back from. Yes. Do I have a slightly off topic? I don't know that we have time for off topic. An off topic math question? If the goal is <coughs> to always be getting more people for Christ, and our country has more people dying than people being born, and that is true all over the world, aren't you eventually going to run out of getting more people for Christ? Okay, I'm going to short circuit this one real quick. <laughs> Whose responsibility is it to bring people to Christ? The Holy Spirit. By what means does the Holy Spirit promise? I'm just poking a hole in his argument. I know. I know. It's it's a hole in Finney's argument, right? By what means does the Holy Spirit bring people to Christ? Through the Word, through the sacrament. Finney rejects this. <coughs> Finney relies on psychological manipulation and emotional control to bring people to Christ. I love it when people say to me at the end of a worship service on a Sunday morning, Pastor, I just didn't get much out of the service today. <laughs> oh, really? Did you hear the word of God read and preached? Did you receive the very body and blood of Christ in, with, and under the bread and wine of the sacrament? What more do you need? Oh, oh, and there it is, right? I wasn't inspired. I didn't feel. Oh. Again, we got to stop right there and ask a question about original sin and Pelagius' error. This is rampant in the church in America. Thankfully, we have this first article of the Formula of Concord that lays bare 
our confession and our rejection of these things. Does that mean, by the way, let me be clear on this as well. Does that mean, Pastor, are you telling me there's no place for emotion in the life of the church? Thank you for playing. No, that's not what I'm saying. But your emotions aren't the barometer of whether God is at work. Let me say that again. Your emotions are not the barometer as to whether God is at work. Fair? Uh, today, as the communion distribution was happening at the 8 o'clock service, we were singing a hymn. And as we were singing the hymn, Allison dropped the organ out and we sang uh, Acapulco. <laughs> and then the organ came back in. And the organ came back in as the congregation began to sing, When from the dust of death I rise. And emotionally, I had a moment. Even thinking about it now, I'm a little verklempt. Thank you, Dave. Right? Because of what that hymn confesses. This then shall be my only plea. Jesus has lived and died for me. Now, if you think hymns aren't emotional, I beg to differ. <laughs> right? But that emotion isn't the barometer of whether or not it was a good worship service today. It's the fruit of confessing the truth in a way that is congruent with my life in the midst of it. And that truth is moving. But it's a byproduct. It's not the standard. Does that make sense? And I'm, I'm all for being emotionally engaged in what you're doing. Right? Ask, ask anybody who knows me. I'm a bit of an emotionally based male. There are a few of us. I wear my heart on my sleeve. You always know what I'm feeling. We got a long way to go and no time to get in, a short time to get there. So eastbound and down, let's go. Uh, we're at, we're at 16, 17, and 18. Let's go 16, 17, and 18. Who's reading for us? <coughs> Since the mic is in front of you, Eric, you want to help us out there? Paragraph 16, 17, and 18. We reject the teaching that in a person the human nature and essence are not entirely corrupt but a person still has something good in him, even in spiritual things, capacity, skill, aptitude, or ability in spiritual things to begin to work or to help working for something good. On the other hand, we also reject the false teachings of the Manichaeans, Manichaeans who taught that original sin, like something essential and self-sustaining, has been infused by Satan into human nature and intermingled with with it, like when poison and wine are mixed. 18 and 12. 18, yep. We reject the teaching that the natural man does not sin, but something else sins apart from man, and on account of this, human nature is not accused, but only original sin in the nature. So 17 and 18 are a nice dichotomy. Where 17 rejects the idea that our sinful nature is so mixed with our created nature that you cannot separate the two ever. That nothing can separate them. Like when you mix wine and poison. But we also reject that the natural man does not sin. <laughs> that is, that human nature is not accused of being guilty of sin, but only the original sin that's in you. Now some might say, but wait, doesn't Paul talk about this? 
When I sin, it is not I who sin, but the sin that lives in me. And that it is Christ who lives in me, that it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Okay, so welcome to how some passages of Scripture are misread to get to this teaching. What are we rejecting here? We're rejecting the idea that you can distinguish between the original sin you have inherited and who you are as a person. What did, what did Genesis say again? Or the Psalms, rather. The Psalms said, who can discern his error? Who can even know his own fault? We don't think like God. Our ways aren't God's ways. Our thoughts aren't God's thoughts. We can't even begin to know the depth of our own sin. I mean, I know the deep darkness of my own heart, but I can't even begin to tell you how corrupt that has made me. So I can't, I can't separate those two things. Nor can I simply blame original sin and not be held accountable for it. Does that make sense? That's what 17 and 18 are laying out for us. So what are the Manichaeans? What are they teaching? Manich so Manichaeans are the same era that Flacius falls into. Not that you guys know who that is either. That's okay. Uh, uh, Flacius and Melanchthon. You guys know the name Melanchthon, right? Uh, so Philip, Philip Melanchthon and uh, Matthias Flacius. I think it's Matthias. I got that. Maybe I got that wrong. Uh, they live at the same time. And while Melanchthon is making compromise after compromise after compromise in order to get along with Rome, Felatius is trying to hold him accountable, but what Felatius is doing in order to hold him accountable is grabbing the pendulum and swinging it the other way. In order to defend the truth, he goes too far. What the formula of Concord does here in the epitome is hold the pendulum right in the middle. And so as we confess what we do believe and reject what we don't, there's this fine line that we seem to keep balancing. Like, original sin really does corrupt the very nature of who we are, and yet, the very nature of who we are is God's good creation and redeemable. Does that make sense? Can you, can you do any of that? We're dead. No, you're dead, right? Exactly, and that's what the first article of this is getting at. Which is going to come in really handy next time we gather to look at the epitome and we talk about free will. Because in this understanding of original sin, a little hat tip to what's coming, are you really free? No, no, you're not really free. Well, Pastor, I chose to come to church today, and I chose to come to Bible study. Yep, that's Article 2, that's free will, we'll get there down the road. Moving right along. Uh, I want to get to this before we run out of time, because it seems to be uh, something that we stumbled upon last week that I want to make sure we explain more clearly. Let's go fast forward uh, Let's get paragraph 21 on the back side of the page. Uh, and then we're going to jump ahead to paragraph 23. So let's read paragraph 21, and then we'll jump ahead to paragraph 23. Who's reading? Dave's back on it. Original sin is not, act, not, I'm sorry. Original sin is not an actual sin that is committed. It is inherent to the nature, substance, and essence of humanity. So even if no wicked thought should ever arise in the heart of a corrupt person, no idle word should be spoken, no wicked deed should be done, human nature is still corrupted through original sin. Original sin is born in us because of the sinful seed and is a source of all other actual sins, such as wicked thoughts, words, and works, as it is written in Matthew 15, 19, out of the hearts come evil thoughts. Also, Genesis 8, 21 says, the intention of a man's heart is evil from his youth. 
See also Genesis 6, 5. But pastor, what about those sweet, innocent babies? Are they innocent? Yeah. How about have an infant? Wait till three in the morning when they're wet and hungry and screaming and crying and don't give a rip that you're tired and want to sleep. Narcissists. <laughs> Paragraph 23. Yep. Now, consider the Latin terms substantia and accidents. Substance and accidents. Or a non-essential quality. Yep. They are not the words of the Holy Scripture and besides are unknown to the ordinary person. So they should not be used in sermons before ordinary, uninstructed people. Simple people should be spared them. You are not uninstructed people. You're here at a Bible study being instructed. I'm going to use these terms, substance and accident. You can tell your dad about this one, okay? Look at the note in the middle of that page. Note. Accident refers to something that just happens to be there. It is a characteristic that is not essential to a person or thing. For example, a person that wears a hat, that would be called an accident. He would still be a human being whether he had a hat on or not. However, certain human characteristics are essential. For example, a human being is either created male or female, man or woman. Gender is an essential human characteristic. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> if gender is an essential human characteristic, what are we denying when we open a door to more than two genders? God's very creation. We are declaring full bore. I am my own God. I decide what I am. Not, I am a creature created by God. I have been given an identity. But, I am my own God. I define who I am. Woo! Wait a minute, Pastor, this stuff was written in the 1500s. Can't possibly apply to today. <laughs> I might beg to differ. <laughs> I might beg to differ. Okay, so, yep. Use the mic, please. Thank you, Aaron. The note itself down below, did that come directly quoted out of the formula? Uh, yeah, the note, the note itself uh, is the note itself is from a introductory article to original sin in order to help you understand what's going on. Right? It's the, the note itself is not quoting the formula of conflict. Uh, if you have your Book of Concord, as you do, you could go to page 471, uh, and we could look at exactly what portion this comes from. So, Heather, what is this portion that we're reading? So, it's an introduction to, here are the controversies that are being taken up by the formula of Concord. And in this part of it, we're describing the con conflict about original sin that we're really taking up. Right? When would that have been written? Uh, as they were preparing the formula of Concord. <coughs> well, this, this quote about gender being an essential human characteristic would have been part of the introduction to that, which would have been like 2000. Right? But it's it's just applying that which the formula teaches. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right? Uh, so I, I, I can't claim to be so wise as to come up with that on my own. I have to give credit where credit is due. Right? 
Uh, so as we prepare to hear about the to do. Sorry, I'm not like texting or playing on my phone. I'm actually taking insulin. No, no, really, I am. Because uh, I can do that from my phone now, thanks to technology. See, not all technology is bad. Uh, so synergism is working with God for your salvation. How does synergism and original sin, how do those two things get related? This is question two on the back of your study guide, by the way. Synergism is you can work with God for your salvation. <coughs> they are mutually exclusive terms. If original sin is rightly confessed, synergism has no place. And again, we looked at this question last week as well. What happens to the work of Christ, to the means of grace, when man is thought to be capable, at least in a minimal way, to cooperate in his conversion and regeneration? What does the gospel become? The gospel becomes a new law. Uh, as I like to say it sometimes, it becomes... Gospel. <laughs> and when you have the gospel, what have you lost? The gospel. What do you still have? The law. Can the law save you? No, the law always accuses. Question four. What difference is there in saying that Christ has redeemed us from our sin and the notion that Christ has redeemed and sanctified our sin? This one's a thinker. If Christ redeemed and sanctified our sin, yep. then you can't do bad stuff on earth. Yep. Which means? Help me out. <laughs> There's no gospel, and, and it doesn't matter what you do. Sin is separate from us, not in us. It means that sin is separate from us, not in us, and therefore it doesn't matter what you do. So eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow Christ saves us. How's that work out? Again, we're all this is this is setting the stage, folks. Article one of the formula of Concord is foundational for all that's going to come after it, including the discussion of free will, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks. You're welcome to read ahead. <laughs> you can find the formula of Concord online. We need to pray. I have to go upstairs. Gracious God, you in your word send great blessings. By your mercy, you call us uh, to believe these things, which we cannot by our own reason or strength come to. We pray that you would continue to, by your grace, bring us life, forgiveness, and salvation that you have poured out in your Son. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'll talk for now.